So this is our last class about greedy algorithms. We will uh, cover a very interesting topic related to data compression and an algorithm that is referred to as Huffman encoding, which is widely used for compressing data without losing any information. Please don't get confused with algorithms such as JPEG for images or MPEG for video in which the compression works by actually throwing away a small portion of the information in um, those objects. So uh, the reading is uh, section 4.8 from your textbook. Let me introduce the problem. So imagine that you have an alphabet. It may be the English alphabet or anything else. And uh, it consists of n um, symbols, right? For example, the 26 uh, symbols of the um, English language. Now, how do you uh, represent these symbols with um, binary words? Of course, one approach is to uh, have a a certain number of bits for every symbol. So if you have uh, 26 symbols, you would need 5 bits. The problem is that we know that not all of the uh, letters of the English uh, language um, appear with the same frequency. And the same is true for all languages, but even uh, beyond the domain of uh, human language, in, in even in more general alphabets, you often have that some symbols um, are used more often than others, even in things like music, for instance. Variable length encodings, where the basic idea is that for symbols that are used very frequently, um, we have uh, a smaller number of bits, and for symbols that are used rarely, we have a larger number of bits. For example, um, if for the letter A in the English alphabet, People have measured that uh, the letter A occurs at about 18.3% um, of the time in, if I give you a, a large corpus of, of English text, while uh, a letter such as uh, Z, for instance, appears only 0.1% of the time. So clearly it doesn't make sense to use the same number of bits for A and for Z. Perhaps for A you could only use one bit, let's say the, let, the, the bit 0, while for um, the letter uh, Z, you may use something that is um, much longer. Now, in general, suppose that I give you for each uh, of these N symbols, what is the frequency? What is this percentage at which this uh, letter appears? We're trying to figure out here what is the code word. Let's call it um, BI for the simple I, right? Uh, the code word is these sequences of bits. So the code word for Z here would be 11110. We're trying to design a, a set of code words, one for each simple. But what are we trying to achieve here? What are we trying to optimize? If we think in terms of transmitting, for instance, texts over the internet, right? You would like to transmit as few bits as possible. Or if you are thinking about storing them in your computer, you would like to store as few bits as possible. So we're trying to choose here these code words. We're trying to choose the set of Bs that they minimize the expected length of uh, a text written in the given alphabet. So suppose that I give you some text with M letters, the expected number of times we expect to see the letter I. And for each uh, instance of letter I, we will need this number of bits to represent it, right? So this is the expected number, let's call it the expected number of bits to represent this text, and we are trying to choose this code, word, code words BI to minimize this quantity. The idea of uh, variable length encoding um, is interesting, but it raises a new issue. Suppose here that I have a very simple alphabet with only five letters, and I give you the frequencies of these letters, and we come up with two different uh, encoding schemes, the code words A and the code words B. Now, suppose that I send you over the internet the sequence of bits 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Can you uniquely decode what this uh, message means? 
One possible decoding with uh, the scheme A is to think of the first bit as um, A, the second bit again as A, and then you have 100 which means C. But you can look at the same bits and have a different decoding. The first letter could be again A, the 0, 1 could be the letter B, and then you have two more zeros which could be A followed by A. So you have no way to know if this is the message that I send you or if this is the message that I send you. With the code words B, you don't have this issue because um, you can tell that the message is A, A, B, and then A. So more generally here, we need to make sure that each code word bi should not be the prefix of another code word. Here, for instance, the 0 is a prefix of the code word 0, 1, and the code word 1, 0, 0 is prefix to both 1, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 0, 0, 1. While here, if you look at this closely, you will see that none of these code words is a prefix of another code word. So why do we need this property? So that when you receive a long sequence of bits like this, you can start from the beginning and you can do your decoding in a very simple manner where you start decoding the bits as you see them in the sequence. Whenever you identify a certain symbol, you output that symbol and you forget that, that sequence of bits. Now, you can easily see that we can represent such variable length encodings that satisfy the prefix uh, free property with binary trees in which the letters are the leaves of the tree. So what do you see in this tree? First of all, it's a binary tree. Every time um, we go left, we have an edge that is marked with zero. Every time we go right, we have an edge marked with one. The letters of the alphabet are leaves of the tree. We don't have any internal nodes that represent letters. And we can find the code word of each letter by going from the root to that letter and finding the sequence of bits that um, we will traverse in that path. For example, to find the code word of C, we have 1, 1, 0. This representation, the binary tree representation, clearly satisfies the prefix tree property because the letters of the alphabet are always leaves in the tree. Now that we know how to represent prefix codes with binary trees, let's go back to the optimization uh, problem that we have. So remember we had a text of M letters this was the expected number of bits that we need in order to transmit a message with M letters using our alphabet of these N symbols and with code words BI. Now there are two things I want you to notice here. The first is simple, that if we divide both sides of this equation by M, the average number of bits that we need per letter is the frequency of simple I times the depth of that symbol in the binary tree. Why is this the case? Imagine that this is my binary tree for representing the code words. The code word length for this letter is the depth of that letter in the tree. This is why I replaced here the length of the code word with the depth of the corresponding letter in the binary tree. What does this tell us about the binary trees that would represent an optimal prefix code? We say that the binary tree is full if every node either has zero children and so it is a leaf or it has two children. We cannot have nodes that only have one uh, child. Imagine that I give you a, a binary tree with a node that only has one child. So what you can do is you can remove that node, collapse this portion um, of the tree into a single edge, and as you see we will definitely have 
lower ABL, a lower average bit length, because we have decreased the depth of at least one code word. So to summarize, an optimal prefix code will definitely be represented as a full binary tree. So now that we know that uh, an optimal encoding tree is a full binary tree, let's prove a structural property that will come uh, very handy later when we design our algorithm. This property says that if i and j are the symbols that have the lowest frequency, then those symbols, they must be at the highest depth of this, of this full binary tree. We cannot have the situation that you see here where the symbols i and j appear at some lower depth than um, the maximum depth of the tree. So we're stating here that both i and j have a frequency that is less than the minimum of the frequencies of the symbols k and l. And we're assuming that in this full binary tree called t, the depth of i is smaller than the depth d max, the maximum depth of the binary tree at which the symbols k and l appear. And similarly for the um, symbol j, it also appears at some depth which is smaller than the maximum depth. So if this is the situation, we can use our exchange argument and construct another uh, tree, let's call it t prime, in which uh, we have exchanged the location of k with i and of l with j. Everything else stays the same. So after we have done this exchange, let's compare the average bit length that is associated with this full binary tree and the average bit length that is associated with this one. Remember what we saw in the previous page that the average bit length is the summation across all of the symbols of the frequency of the symbol times the depth of that simple i in the full binary tree. So if I calculate the difference between the average bit length in this tree minus the average bit length in the tree t prime, this is the term that is associated with the average bit length of the tree t and this is the term associated with the t prime. As you see here we have a term for k and l, the frequencies of k and l at the depth d max. i is at depth i di and j is at the depth dj. While here the i and the j symbols appear at the length d max the k symbol appears at the length that was previously uh, the, the, the depth of symbol i, so di, and uh, the symbol l appears at the depth dj. So if I just apply algebra in this difference, I get the following. So just by rearranging the terms, I have the difference of these two frequencies, fk minus fi, which is positive, remember this inequality, times d max minus d i, which is also positive, plus f l minus f j, which is also positive, times d max minus d j, which is also positive. So all of these are positive, which means that the difference between the average bit length of these two trees is positive. In other words, going from this tree to this tree, after we apply our exchange argument, we reduce the average uh, bit uh, length of the tree. This proves that the symbols with the lowest frequency, they have to be at the bottom, at the maximum depth of the tree. If, if they are not, then we can always place them at the maximum depth and reduce the average bit length.